Hello, my name's Richard Felix, and I'm going to take you on a tour of haunted Somerset and Bristol. And what better place to start this tour than here in front of the tour at Glastonbury. Underneath the 14th century tower of St Michael, it's believed lies the Holy Grail. The word Glastonbury in Celtic mythology means glassy island. And when this area of Somerset was under flood water and marshland, it was believed that these islands were the places where the souls of the dead parted from the bodies and were delivered to the fairy king Gwyn. Also, in Arthurian mythology, it is believed that this place was Avalon, the place where King Arthur and his Queen Guinevere were buried. Some of the stories that you're going to hear are to do with real hauntings, ghosts and spirits. Others are going to be of what I believe are nothing more than recordings to do with tragic, traumatic, premature death, murders, suicides, battles and executions. Their time hadn't come and I believe that the energy used by the body and the brain in resisting death could be so immense that those events can actually be replayed either on the anniversary of the event or when the atmosphere is similar. Those, I believe, aren't real ghosts and I believe that's what a lot of people see. It's no more exciting than pressing the replay button of your video player. You see that event again in exactly the same position and when it was recorded in the bricks, the woodwork, the stone and possibly even the soil. So, settle back, turn down the lights, give me your full attention and let me take you on a tour of haunted Somerset and Bristol. We're in Taunton. Behind me here, the remnants of Taunton Castle. It now houses Somerset County Museum. This is where the bloody assizes were held in September 1685. So let's go in and explore, see if we can find any ghosts. I'm standing in a very haunted room in the centre of Taunton, the county town of Somerset. This is the Great Hall of Taunton Castle. After Monmouth's Rebellion in 1685, the bloody assizes were held in the West Country. And here, the most bloody assizes of all were held in September 1685. In this very room, Judge Jeffreys the hanging judge sat at one end of this room presiding over the courts and over 156 peasants and yeomen from Somerset were sentenced here in this room to be hanged, drawn and quartered for high treason. That was not a pretty sight. The sentence was that you be taken back from this courtroom to the prison from whence you came and from there to a place of lawful execution where you will be severally hanged by the neck but taken down while you are still alive your privy parts cut off your bowels and entrails taken out and burnt before your eyes your head to be severed from your body and your body to be divided into four equal quarters and may the Lord have mercy upon your soul that very sentence was carried out here around Taunton and in the villages and towns of Somerset in 1685. No wonder this room is haunted with the fear and trepidation and anguish that must have been felt by those poor 
and fortunate people that rebelled against King James II. There are various ghost stories. There's the ghost of a girl, a 17th century girl, wandering around the building. And remember, of course, that men and women were sentenced, not only to be hanged, hanged, drawn and quartered, and transported for life in this very room. Also, the ghost of Judge Jeffreys has been seen in here. And when you think he caused all that terrible death and anguish, pain and suffering, then no wonder his tormented soul still wanders around here to this very day. There isn't an awful lot of original features left in this great hall. This is one of the original windows that would have looked down on those poor unfortunate rebels in this room. Up here on the wall, the coat of arms of King Charles II. The Duke of Monmouth, of course, was Charles II's illegitimate son and a Protestant, and of course he believed that he should have been the rightful King of England, not Charles's Catholic brother. And another story here at this point, a curator once here a few years ago, standing, looking in one of the cases, and suddenly felt something tight around his neck. Some people think it could have been a pair of hands trying to strangle him, but other people believe that it could have been the hempen noose the hangman's rope tightening slowly about his neck here in this very room. This is the old Tudor tavern. Judge Jeffreys is reputed to have stayed here while he was conducting the bloody assizes of 1685 but as you can see the building goes back nearly a hundred years before that as in dated 1578. Jeffrey's ghost is supposed to wander the top floors in the room that he stayed and on many occasions both customers and staff have reported seeing the ghostly spectre of a man with a long white wig and 17th century clothes walking about the upper floors. Unfortunately, it's closed and it's been sold. I don't think I can get in, but I'm going to try. Nope. I can just see through, it looks fantastic, but I can't get in. I shall have to come back when it reopens. And behind me here, the magnificent Castle Hotel. Parts of the original castle are incorporated in this building. And it has a ghost. In fact, it has a music room but it has a very strange music room, a ghostly music room, because on frequent occasions, guests here at the Castle Hotel have heard strange ghostly music, violin music. But of course, there's never anybody in the room playing the violin. The television isn't on, the radio isn't on, but the music continues, sometimes well into the dead of night. I'm walking along Dead Woman's Ditch. This was part of an old Iron Age fort 
on top of the Quantox here in Somerset. In 1789, a horrendous murder took place near this spot. A young charcoal burner called John Walford, who lived in a hut not far from here, was very fond of a young girl called Anne Rice. But due to the isolated location of his hut, he didn't see her very often. He couldn't get into town very often to visit her. And he was forever bothered by a slut of a girl that lived in the neighboring area, a girl called Jenny. He got her pregnant and 17 days later married her and then murdered her. He beat her to death with a wooden club and threw her body into this ditch, which ever since has been known as Dead Woman's Ditch. He was caught, sentenced at the Assizes to hang for murder. But before he was hanged, in the condemned cell of the county jail, he was measured for his last suit. That was a metal cage, a gibbet cage. After he was hanged for the customary hour, his body was tarred to preserve it. He was then put into the cage and hung up 30 feet high on a gibbet post and left there for a year and a day. His bleaching bones swinging in the breeze and the crows pecking at his flesh and his eyes until eventually he was taken down and buried beneath the gibbet post. His ghost still wanders along this trackway here. Hikers, ramblers and walkers have often spoken of seeing the ghost of a man in 18th century costume. And also in this ditch has been seen the ghost of Jenny Walford, his wife whom he battered to death, killing not only her, but of course, her unborn child as well. This is the sleepy little graveyard of Chilton Cantello in Somerset. Across the road from this churchyard is an old farmhouse. In that farmhouse is a screaming skull. It's the skull of a gentleman called Theophilus Broom who died in 1670 and for some strange reason had a fear of his skull or his head being buried with his body. So he left instructions for his skull to remain in the farmhouse. On many occasions over the past few hundred years, successive farmers have tried to rebury the skull, but to no avail. Every time the skull is buried, it starts to scream. And despite whatever anyone tries to do, that skull will not be buried. And so it remains quite happy in the farmhouse. The rest of Mr. Broom's body is buried here at St. James's Church. But unfortunately, the church is closed. And we can't get in to have a look at his tomb but I believe that they do bed and breakfast at the farm. So if you want a real haunted house, then what better place than to come here to the little village of Chilton Cantillo.
I'm standing on a very, very busy road about two miles outside Shepton Mallet. At one time in the 1800s, five roads converged here. And there was always an inn here. It's now called Canard's Grave Inn. And it dates back to 1625. Giles Canard was the landlord here at the inn. He was in with highwaymen and smugglers. But at a later date, he also started forging. This was too much for the authorities. They arrested him. He asked if he could go upstairs first to bring some clothing with him. And whilst upstairs, he tied a piece of cord around his neck and hanged himself. They buried him here at the crossroads, as they did with suicides. And to stop his ghost walking, they hammered a stake of wood through his heart. But it didn't stop Giles Cannard from walking, because even to this day, his ghostly apparition is seen by many travellers, motorists, and people who live in the village standing on the side of the road in the company of other ghostly highwaymen. I'm just coming out of Lee Woods. They're right on top of the hill overlooking the Clifton Suspension Bridge. And this spot here at the edge of Lee Woods is haunted by no less than the ghost of Isambard Kingdom Brunel, probably one of the most famous people connected with the city of Bristol. Over here is the most incredible view of the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Along with the SS Great Britain, it was created, designed by no less than Brunel himself. But he died before the bridge was completed. And legend has it that his ghost has been seen here on this spot many times, standing, wearing a long frock coat and of course that large stovepipe top hat that everyone recognises. Now why should he haunt this spot here? He didn't die here. This was his great love the suspension bridge and he didn't see it completed. How many times that man must have stood here on this vantage point looking over at the gorge imagining where one day his magnificent suspension bridge would stand is probably the reason why his spirit still stands here. Many many sightings of ghosts are recorded to do with buildings, properties, even cars, where people who love that, that vehicle don't actually want to leave it, and they linger, still haunting the vehicle, sometimes even people. They actually love that person so much that they stay around to look after them. And I would think that's the reason that Brunel is seen standing here, gazing across the gorge longingly, looking at the bridge that he never saw completed. Now, of course, while we're in Lee Woods, the suspension bridge has always been, and still is to this day, for want of a better word, a haven for suicides. In fact, as we drove over it this morning, there's actually a sign on the bridge advertising the Samaritans. And there is a sighting of another man, a young man, a modern looking person, wandering through these woods, always heading towards the end of the suspension bridge. And it's believed that he is one of the many people that actually threw himself off the bridge into the gorge and of course the reason 
that so many suicides haunt places is because of a the tragic traumatic death of course of, of throwing yourself off the top of, of something like the suspension bridge but also the fact that of course taking their own life meant that they would not be allowed through the gates of heaven and will be condemned to wander this earth as a tormented soul for all of eternity. Bristol Cathedral, the Cathedral of the Holy and Undivided Trinity, founded between 1150 and 1160. And would you believe it boasts its own ghost? It's the ghost of a monk, always seen wearing a grey habit. It wanders out of the doors of the cathedral, along this square, and always disappears into the library, which is next door. The library stands on the site of an old Augustinian priory. The strange thing is, of course, that the Augustinians wore black habits, but this monk is always seen wearing grey. Perhaps he's a visiting monk, no one knows, but he's been seen of lots of times going through theological documents in the library. His entrance point is through here, which is one of the original parts of the Augustinian Priory. And here we see a bricked up doorway. This is where the monk goes into the library. And of course, there's a lot of stone here. And sightings of ghosts are often made around stone buildings because for some reason they believe that especially stone contains certain properties similar to recording tapes, videotapes and cassettes. There was a programme many years on the TV called The Stone Tapes and it's believed that stone can contain a recording of a tragic or traumatic event that happened many hundreds of years ago and on certain occasions on the anniversary of that death or when the atmosphere is the same the stone unleashes that recording again and you see the event that happened all those years ago And here I am in the centre of Bristol. Historic Bristol, city of tall ships, traders, smugglers and slavery. To my right, the River Avon. And behind me, one of the most historic inns in the centre of the city, the Landogger Trow. An old, old inn going back to 1664 with a ghost, the ghost of a little boy. So why not join me inside and let's have a look for him. Landogger is a village in Wales and a trow was a flat bottom boat which used to sail up the River Avon and the River Severn into the centre of Bristol. This is a very old pub, it goes back to 1664 and I'm actually in the heart, the core of the old building. Daniel Defoe visited this place and Robert Louis Stevenson mentioned this place in Treasure Island and it's got a ghost. It's got the ghost of a little boy, a lame little boy that some say was murdered here in this inn. He's been heard wandering around the building. They hear his footsteps going along the landing and they hear his footsteps going up and down this staircase. He was a lame little boy, and so you could hear the clomping of his feet on this very staircase that I'm going up now. It's a very large staircase, very, very old wood and very high and some of the original doors still here and on certain occasions the little boy's been seen 
and whenever they see him, he's been seen coming down this staircase, carrying a white enamel pail in his hands. And one or two people still live in here. And the landlord has told me today that unfortunately they're all out, but quite a few people still see the ghost of that little boy walking down these stairs to this very day. But I can't see anybody. So I'm going before I do. This must be one of the most haunted sites in the whole of Somerset. This plaque here marks the burial place at the back in this field of many of the soldiers that fell during Monmouth Rebellion. And the plaque states, to the glory of God and in memory of all those who doing the right as they gave it, fell in the Battle of Sedgemoor, 6th of July, 1685, and lie buried in this field, or who, for their share in the fight, suffered death, punishment, or transportation. Pro Patria. The Duke of Monmouth, the bastard son of Charles II, landed in Lyme Regis in 1685. He was taking the throne that he believed was his back from the Catholic King James II. He raised an army of over 5,000 peasants and yeomen from Somerset. And on the 6th of July, they gave battle here against the King's army. Unfortunately, they were decimated by the cannon fire and the musket fire of the much better trained troops of King James II. Many soldiers died on this spot and are buried here. Others were taken back to places like Taunton for the bloody assizes, where they were sentenced to be hanged, drawn and quartered, or transported for life. There was so much anguish, death, fear and pain around this area that the psychic echoes linger to this very day and are reflected in many, many stories of hauntings in towns and villages around this ill-fated battlefield of Sedgemoor. There are many stories of hauntings and ghostly sightings on this battlefield. Behind me here, the King's Sedgemoor drain, a large ditch for irrigating the land. On many occasions, people walking along this trackway have heard ghostly voices of men, of soldiers, shouting the words, come on over, come on over. And it was the cry given by the Duke of Monmouth's men, his peasant army, shouting at the King's army who were on the other side of the ditch, firing musket balls and cannonballs into the poor rebel army on the other side of the ditch. There was no need for the King's army to come over because their cannonballs and musket balls wreaked havoc through the rebel army. Strange sightings of balls of light or orbs have been seen at night hovering over the battlefield, over the site where the soldiers are buried. There's been a lot of research done recently by TV companies into these orbs. They've only been spotted on camera since there's been digital still cameras and video cameras. And it's believed that these little orbs of light are in fact the first manifestations of spirits, of ghosts. Of course, everyone expects a ghost to look like a ghostly figure with a hood and clanking of chains, but this is not so. And it is actually believed that these orbs are, if you like, the new ghosts, the modern ghosts. The Duke of Monmouth himself has been seen on this battlefield always reported seen around the 15th of July, which is the day that he was executed at Tower Hill in London. It took the executioner, Jack Ketch, 
five blows of his axe to sever the Duke's head. And even after the fifth blow, the head was still hanging from the neck, the body still twitching. And the High Sheriff of London ordered the executioner to use his pocket knife to cut the last sinews of the neck and then hold up the head of the Duke of Monmouth, shouting the words, Behold, the head of a traitor. No wonder with such a tragic, traumatic death that the Duke of Monmouth still haunts this battlefield to this very day. I've climbed over the fence where the monument is and I'm now standing on the field of the dead. On the anniversary of the battle for many years, villagers stated that they could hear the cry of battle, drums beating, they could see banners flying, and they could hear the shouts and the screams of the soldiers lying wounded and some of those being put to death. And as I say, for many years, people could actually see a reenactment of that battle in the skies above the village of Western Zoyland. But over the years, it's a long time ago, it was 1685, it seems to have faded out. One unfortunate soldier, a rebel from the village, who was an athlete, was captured and was told that if he could race against a horse and either keep up with it or win, they would spare his life. And the race was organised along the trackway and he kept up with the horse all the way. But the soldiers reneged on the deal and put him to the sword and he's buried here somewhere in this field with his comrades. His ghost has been heard running along the trackway but at the same time people say they've heard the snorting of a horse galloping alongside him. And his girlfriend from the village was so distressed that she threw herself in the Sedgemoor drain and drowned and her ghost also has been seen around this monument. But of course, as I've said, with so much terror and pain and torment, no wonder this is such a haunted place. And I'm in the middle of the little village of Western Zoyland and we've just come across this incredible pub, the Sedgemoor Inn. This goes back to at least 1674 and was here while the battle was raging. And I have it on good authority that they've got a ghost inside as well. So let's go in and have a look. And we're actually inside the Sedgemoor Inn. This was actually here, yes, at the, at the time of yeah, the battle. Part of it. Well, part yeah. Of it. yeah. And you are landlady and mum. Yeah. yeah. And so parts of this pub were actually in existence when the fighting was going on around here. Yeah. Wow. There's a plaque over there on the wall. There's loads, loads of interesting oh, stuff. Yeah, stayed here. There's loads of interesting. Yeah, it's an amazing old place. But you've got a ghost in the building. Supposedly, yeah. Really, and and what? Well, I mean, I know it's all it's all recorded here in yeah. in, in your book, but yeah. uh, but it's a girl apparently. Yeah, Mary Bridge. Bridge. Mary Bridge. Bridge yeah. And and any idea why she haunts the place? She's supposed to have killed a royalist soldier who was raping her mother. Right. So whether, uh, mind you, she got away with it, didn't she? They did. Well, there's no record of what they did. Oh, so so as far as you know, she wasn't. Know. Mind you, they executed so many yeah, people yeah. around here that she may well have been executed at the bloody assizes right. in Taunton with, with many others. But she's actually been seen, of course, yeah. down here, has she yeah. not, by the... Uh, by the um... by, and this is, again, original fireplace, of course. 
Christine certainly Christine looks Christine it to me. Christine? And they say she walks across in front of the fireplace. According to, well, according to the book, a couple of people have seen her and that's where she's been going. Right. Now, now this so is interesting, is it not? Because that is... Supposedly where they sharpened the swords. That's the, the soldiers. Right the bow, yeah. the and they would have been the royalist soldiers yeah. probably here. Yeah. And those, so those are actual sword marks yeah. made by the swords of the... And of course here we have replica helmet of the Royal Army, I presume. Yeah. Would be, yeah. yeah. And even cannonball. Now, for all we know, because um, they're extremely heavy, yeah. I would imagine that was probably picked up on the battlefield here, because this is, of course, what was doing all the, the damage yeah. to Monmouth soldiers, these, these massive cannonballs. Yeah. So uh, this place uh, has really got quite a story yeah. to tell yeah. about oh, yeah. the battlefield, the battle and um, that incredible revolution of 1685. Yeah. Super. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And of course, no ghost tour of Somerset would be complete without a trip to the haunted spa town of Bath. Its origins go back to the time of King Lud, legendary King of Britain. His son contracted leprosy and was sent away from the court. He became a swineherd looking after pigs. He drove the pigs into a large bog because they also had contracted leprosy. They went through the bog and sank. He was most concerned at losing the pigs and so he hauled them out one at a time. And then he noticed that the leprosy that the pigs had contracted had gone. So he jumped into the bog and realised that he also was cleansed. He returned home to the court and ordered wells to be sunk in the exact place where that bog had been. And those wells gave rise to the legendary spa town here at Bath. There are, of course, many ghost stories which of course really can be left to the magnificent ghost tours that operate round Bath but one that's been brought to my notice is of a gay ghost in would you believe Gay Street and it's a man with white hair tied in a ponytail but apparently he only appears to men and boys but I don't go there Hello, my name's Richard Felix and I'm here at my base at the Old County Jail in the centre of Derby. This place over the last 150 years has been a place of terror, torment and of course death. And that's one of the reasons why this place is as haunted as it is. I've chosen Derby as the catalyst for the national ghost tour of Great Britain. Over the last 10 years, I have taken in excess of 95,000 people on a ghost tour somewhere around the Midlands. And of course, have spoken to many of those people on the tours and of course have realised just how fascinated people are by ghosts. This is the reason that we have chosen to do this tour. The video that you've just watched is a part of that series, but I want your help. If you have a ghost story, then please either email me or write to me at the address that you'll see at the end of this video. Of course, you must remember that after speaking to so many people, I think I have an ability to be able to see through some of the stories, to be able to differentiate between a story that is true or a story that's made up. And of course, you must remember that eight 
out of ten ghost stories can be explained. But it's the other two that you've got to worry about. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Do sleep well and don't have nightmares. Yeah. Mm -hmm.